Hey, welcome to the New Home Insights Podcast by John Burns Real Estate Consulting. I'm Dean Worley, your host. Each episode, we're gonna bring you some of the best minds in the housing business talking about some fascinating topics or trend or innovation or issue, just like the one you're about to listen to. Enjoy. Welcome to the New Home Insights Podcast. That's the John Burns Real Estate Consulting Podcast about the U.S. housing market. I'm your host, Dean Worley. Master plans are often the backbone of residential housing supply, especially in those fast growing markets. With great respect to all of our friends in Texas and Arizona and the Carolinas and, and everywhere else in Florida, building really great master plans for a very long time, kind of the shape of master plans has been set in Orange County, California. One of the developers that has been doing that and bringing a lot of innovation into master plans for decades has been the Rancho Mission Viejo Company. So today, we're going to talk to Chris Maher. She's the Senior Vice President at the Rancho Mission Viejo Company. We're going to cover some key ingredients that what makes master plans great, but we're also going to dig into some nuance, some strategy, but how you turn just a parcel into a place. And then we're going to talk about not just the near future of great master plans, but we're gonna stretch Chris's crystal ball and talk about maybe some little more mid future of, of what's going to make a great master plan. Chris, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you very much for having me. I didn't realize I was gonna need my crystal ball today though, so I'll, I'll do <laughs> my best. Everybody, everybody <laughs> comes on the show and needs to have their crystal ball already. <laughs> but in your case, longer than most, for sure. I, which I think will be fun. It'll be fun because I, I don't know the answers for those at all. So I'm I'm waiting. So why don't you first let's start do this briefly. Give us a little bit of background on you and then also what you do and what Rancho Mission Viejo Company has done and does. I'll start with Rancho Mission Viejo Company. So we've been master developers of communities for over 60 years now. Um, we're family owned. We build in one location in South Orange County. Um so that gives us a real deep foothold with our buyers who are with us for years and years, buy from, from community to community over, year, over the years. And it really makes that it a legacy play for the family and for the communities that we build. It's very, very important to us. A little bit about me is um, I was lucky enough to know that I wanted to be an architect from the time I was 16. So I went down that path, became an architect, worked for architect architectural firms in the early part of my community, moved down to a couple of home builders. And then I finally got into the development side when Rancho Mission Viejo reached out to me uh, 20 years ago now. So I've worked for the company for 20 years. I'm on the community development side. I oversee all the front end planning, uh, all the parks and amenities, uh, the marketing program, all the fun stuff, all the, all the real fun stuff that we get to do. That is the fun stuff, honestly. That yes. is the, the, it's, it's the creative side. Yes. So let's start with that kind of idea of what makes the master plan great, but let's do that in kind of like a visual tour. Let's, okay. let's drive through, or better yet, let's bike through. Let's be sustainable. Are we on e-bikes? We're silly over here. Yes. Let's be on e-bikes. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's do electric. Let's do e-scooters. Cool. <laughs> I still want to. I kind of want to get when my wife is having none of that. So, you have this beautiful. You're entering the master plan. You start with that monumentation. What are you trying to do there? What are you doing to sort of brand or connect with your buyers right there at the entry? Well, you really have to start and think about the theming and the visual, the visuals that you want to create. And for us here at Rancho Mission Viejo, because our villages are not contiguous, we really have to have a layered impact to our monumentation, meaning as you're entering the, 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 the community, we have to have the large scale uh, monuments that say Rancho Mission Viejo and set the tone and they, they take on more of a ranch theme because you really are entering a working ranch. And then as we develop the villages further from that, the villages tend to take on different characters depending on where they are. If they're a little bit closer in, we, we go a little bit more, I would say not, we never really get away from our ranch roots, but we go to something that might be a little bit more um, current and modern. Uh, but always with the same material. So you really have to think about your overall theming and visioning as you're creating your monumentation program. But you're never going to do something that looks sort of ultra modern. You're not going to go for that, you know, locals you know, run science fiction font or something like that. 
Probably not, but for us, we definitely have um, pushed the boundaries a little bit more as we moved into our latest village of Rienda. We built smaller, more attainable homes, so we knew we were attracting uh, millennials and even some Gen Zers, a lot of first-time buyers. So we really tried to get a little bit more um, current with our monumentation in in Rienda. So we know we do think about all that. Okay. Okay. So let's e-bike, or I'm sorry, let's scooter. Let's continue. (laughs) We, We checked out your monumentation. We're now scootering over to the first neighborhood. Does that have to be the quote unquote right neighborhood? Does that have to brand or make a statement about the overall master plan right away? The product, the the, the, the architecture? You know, I, I think the, the what you need to, what you're trying to accomplish with your first neighborhood is you're trying to figure out who your buyer is. You always want to know who your buyer is. You want to understand your market. And once you understand that, you you can put the proper blend of neighborhoods, different segmentations on the ground, with appropriate architectural styles for the size of the home and for where you are in the community. Meaning, you know, are you doing a lot of attached? Are you doing more larger single family detached? You really have to start to think about what your styles, what your architectural themes are gonna be. So now, okay, we're leaving, we're on our scooters and maybe we have our our three kids on their smaller scooters behind us like gasolines, but (laughs) we're going to, we wanna go to our amenity center. We want to, I don't know, maybe we want to swim or maybe we want to lift because we're trying to stay fit. (laughs) Do you, do you want that to be very central or do you sometimes want to disperse your amenities throughout or both? How how do you think about that? The way we would think about that and anyone should think about that is really, you have to think about the scale of your community. So if you're building a couple hundred homes, you're probably going to have a smaller amenity, more centrally located. Um, If you build at the scale that we do, um, thousands of homes across multiple villages, you're gonna want to have significant amenities, but then you're gonna want to reach out into the neighborhoods and put smaller plunge pools, parks, trails. So it really, that boils down to what, what the scale of your community is. And it's different for every community. It's different for us uh, as we move from village to village. But the, generally speaking, the bigger you are, the bigger your community is, the more likely you do want to disperse some Absolutely. of those. Many. Would you still always have, though, that core big central amenity that everybody's kind of going to on the weekends or what have you? We choose to do that. We always build a big, a large, splashy amenity. Um, but then you have to realize that that's not going to be for everyone, especially on a weekend when there's a lot of kids and, you know, it's pretty crazy. You're still going to want to put those little plunge pools out on the edges, on the fringes. So there's something for everyone. And, and um, you know, as you know, we also do 55 plus neighborhoods. And so they absolutely need their own pool and spa. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, so now let's think about the next neighborhood or sort of the rest of the neighborhoods. What is your ideal product segmentation, the different kinds of homes you have, different price points? Do you want to be as varied as possible or do you really want to focus on those couple of key segments that you think are absolutely the backbone of your demand? The best thing to do is to try to capture as much of the market as you can. So once you understand who your buyer is and who you're going after, those are the homes you want to put on the ground, but you want to capture. Um, so if you want to have starter homes that say in, 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 our, in our current village of Rienda, we have a one bedroom, one bath condominium at 700 to 725 square feet with a one car garage. Hmm. But we got up as high as 2,400 square feet in the 2,400 uh, in the single family detached. So, and then we have everything in between. Yeah. We have, we have um, duplexes, we have high density detached, we got up to the single family detached, but we tried to cast our net quite wide to capture as much of the market. What we didn't get are move up buyers, because when you top out at about 2,400, okay. you're not going to get a lot of move up buyers. And we didn't get, we're not getting any 55 plus. So that's, as we look to the next phase of a development, mm. that's what we're going to go after. I'm glad you added that context because that 2400 seems a little small to top out at, but you're you're specifically going for that part of the market. That's you're, you're not going for that second move up executive part. How big That's- historically at Rancho have you gone with your other master plans where some neighborhoods were aimed at those second move up or executive buyers? You know, we've gotten up into 3000 square foot homes. Um, okay. 
which is sort of an interesting, uh, it was, it was an interesting idea at the time didn't work out so well for us. Um, but we, we have, we have gone into that and in a future phase coming up, we also, we've gone to multi-gen homes. And so those are getting up to 3,600 square feet. I have a little bit of a uh, 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 blood pressure uh, over that because, you know, that that's just a, a hugely expensive home right now. And the timing of when we put it on the ground, which we don't know right now, um, that, that uh, <laughs> gives me a little concern. <laughs> for some context for our people, we have a national audience for some context. Re- remember, this is Orange County. So a 3,000 plus square foot home is a big chunk of change. So it is tougher to get really, really big in a market like that. It's a big chunk of change. Yeah. Do you always have or really look to have some rental component, like some apartment complex there? Are you also jumping on board and thinking about having build to rent neighborhoods at your master plans? We absolutely, we build a lot of apartments um, and we try to appeal to different market segments. We've done 55 plus apartments. We've done market rate apartments. We've recently done more um, apartment townhomes. Um and that was sort of our response for, to build to rent. Uh, build to rent as a model doesn't work here in South Orange County. Our land basis is just too high. We've looked at it a number of times over the years, and it just doesn't pencil right now. Maybe someday. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that, again, Orange County, very, very high home prices. That makes total sense. Yeah. How do you deal with, let's say, a not ideal adjacent use or surrounding use like railroad tracks or uh, auto body shop or worse, a Chuck E. Cheese, the worst possible <laughs> adjacent use. Do you, do you think about buffers? What, what's the best way to deal with that? Well, fortunately, at Rancho Mission Viejo, really our only yeah. nasty use are, are cell towers, which people tend not to like, uh, although they're a necessary evil, right? Yeah. But I have worked <laughs> on projects uh, next to railroad tracks uh, with oil wells Uh, backing up to busy roads. Um, And the best thing you can do is try to turn your back to those elements as best you can. Uh, You have to understand that you may have to price your way around it. Um, If you have a competing community that doesn't have those types of issues, you're going to have to, you know, consider how you're pricing to attract a buyer that says, you know what, I can deal with that at that price. Would you think, though, about, I don't know, having like a linear park or doing something like that to sort of buffer from the, especially if it's a noisy surrounding use or adjacent use? You know, that's an option. You just have to figure out, is that is that obstacle going to impact the value of the linear park then? Are people going to want to use the linear park? So it, you just, it's trade-offs. It's okay. all trade-offs. Okay. And by the way, Chuck E. G's lawyer, I was just kidding. Just calm down. <laughs> so uh, what have you done that didn't work? And if, if, it, if it was, you know, it didn't work and you realized it didn't work, what did you do to fix it? We've done a number of things that has <laughs> worked over the years, um, both on the product side and on the amenity side. Um, one thing we did recently is we built a 55 plus plunge pool uh, amenity and we didn't put a spa in. And the residents started moving in. They were very, really upset about not having a spa. And we kept saying, oh, hold on, hold on. You know, we're going to be building a big spa at what we're calling the Hilltop Club, which is a massive amenity that was coming on board in a year or so. So we kept, you know, pushing back on saying, no, no, you'll be happy. Just wait, just wait. Because the Hilltop Club was a huge intergenerational clubhouse. Well, we all know what happens when you open a spa at a market rate amenity. It's all the kids. And so it did not solve our problem at all. We had to go back in and retrofit fit a spa in at their actual exclusive clubhouse. Um, and then this is kind of funny. For some reason, we built a casting pond. Don't know why. Never got used. And uh, one day, a friend of mine sends me some pictures of his dog in a pond. I was like, where is that? He said, oh, it's in the casting pond. I said, you're not supposed to have dogs in there. <laughs> but a, a light went off in my head and I said, why not? Why wouldn't we allow dogs in there? That's a great idea. So we we modified it by putting the dog waste bags in the space. We stopped calling it the casting pond. We rebranded it as the pond. We took the no dogs allowed sign off. And now if people pick up on it, they go in there and they can let their dogs splash around. So um, you now have a dog pond. Now we have a dog pond. <laughs> All right. That's a good solution. And then on the product side... 
On the product side, um, in the last phase of Ascensia, we had a lot of neighborhoods selling at the same time. And so we ended up putting um, a, a product on the ground, large single family, uh, single family detached homes, single level living, up to 3,200 square feet. I think the lots were 80 feet wide by 95 feet deep. And it just wasn't the right product in the right location. It was across the street from a linear park. A bunch of the homes faced onto um, a zip line. Um, the homes on the back edge had a nice view over a sports park and those sold well. But in this whole phase of, of, of Sensia that these uh, got put in, it was all very small homes, more affordable. So it's these, these large scale homes, very expensive, just felt like an outlier. So we worked with the builder. We agreed that it was a problem. We cut the lots in half. We went from 80 feet wide to 40 feet wide, mm. put um, two-story single family homes on the ground, real real family homes, and they just sold like hotcakes. So, you know, luckily we were, we were in a position where we could just very simply cut the lots in half and that worked out really well. Yeah. Is it like that sometimes though, where it's not just the overall product segmentation, but also almost like how do you blend your neighborhoods one to the next? Are you always thinking about that? It really is because, you know, you think about it. Everything around those homes was going to be significantly less. So how is someone, if they wanted to resell it, get a comp? You know, it's going to impact their ability. So, yeah, it's, it can be challenging. Especially if you have the age qualified Nexus, a very family oriented product. Have you thought about moats, an old fashioned castle moat? <laughs> moats and alligators. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. A troll. Uh, bring, yes, bring alligators to California. That would go over very well with fishing game. Yeah. One thing that I heard did work was this kind of like this children's pen by a pool. <laughs> yeah. Where I, I heard that was huge. You know, it was sort of an afterthought uh, add-in to a design. Uh, we were building a very large lagoon. It's a, a half-acre water lagoon. Um, and, you know, we know that parents don't always really want to watch their kids, right? They, they, they want to be able to sit back and, you know, maybe have their glass of wine and, you know, not, not tend to their kids every second. So we thought, what can we do? to enhance the parents' experience where they don't have to really worry about their kids around this huge lagoon. So we built a little fenced-in area. Then the fence is probably about three feet tall. It's wrought iron. And we threw all these foam toys in there. And it was amazing. When we had our grand opening, I could not believe the number of kids who made a beeline for that little that little space, hitting each other with the foam pieces. We had um, Adirondack chairs in the, for the parents, so the parents are all just sitting back on their phones. The kids are having a great time. It was the most popular space that we had built, and I so, it's those things you just don't expect. Wow, on their third glass of wine, I like that. That's a, it's not a bad idea. That's like exactly. it's like the it's like the puppy bowl. Uh, wait, just let puppy it go. <laughs> have fun guys um what no, okay so let's switch over let's talk about that difference what the, the kind of difference that a master plan can make let's start with the most obvious thing is just price well yeah. how do you calculate or what do you think is that premium of a master plan versus that same house in a standalone neighborhood you know we actually uh, looked into that a number of years ago probably about three years ago at this point in time uh, because we wanted to know, um, and, and really we wanted to know, it, it was as we were planning Rienda and just thinking about amenities and how expensive they are to build, how much it is for the HOA dues, how it burdens the HOA dues because of the ongoing maintenance. And so you really have to make sure that you're getting your value out of amenities and not you know, making it difficult for the homeowner in terms of increased HOAs, making it difficult on the master developer in terms of the construction costs and, and the, the, the amount of work that goes into putting amenities on the ground. So we, we wanted to answer that question. And what we discovered is that depending on the level of amenitization, there's a 3 to 8% retail lift in pricing. And so that that's a big deal. I mean, yeah. if you can obtain that, by amenitizing, and you can choose your level of amenitization, uh, but that's significant. 
And my guess is in other markets, Orange County is a relatively cohesive environment and much, especially your part of Orange County and South County. I wonder if it's a little more in some places where the surrounding, the, the, the metro area is a, is a little less cohesive. Does that make sense? I mean, you can heighten that impact. Absolutely. Chris, what is, do you think the premium that you see for master plans is based on? Is it purely the amenities and also kind of the cohesive environment it promises or even kind of the like demographics among residents there? Is it all those things or other things? I think, I, yeah, I think it's probably all those things. Um, there's no doubt that you will pay more for a home in a master plan community. But with that said, versus a resale home, you know, new homes have all the technology, um, you know, I, I have to cobble my house together to figure technology out. But if you buy a new home, you know, it's it's all there and it works perfectly. And um, so, yeah, I, I do believe it's all that. It's location. It's the lifestyle. It's um, the ambiance of a new community, all the new amenities. And I've, I've moved into new um, communities twice. And there is nothing like moving into a neighborhood and you're all on the same page and everybody's so excited. And it's just a really, really cool experience just having that. Um, you're instant friends with everyone. And that's what makes it so wonderful, I think. Then, and you can't put a price on that. Yeah. Is there a type, a buyer type that really tends to accentuate that? master plan appeal versus is it demographics for instance or or a segment of the buyer of the home buyers i can't say that there's one buyer segment versus another that is not drawn to a master plan we sell to first time buyers we sell to families we sell to parents grandparents and and that's one thing that we see is a lot a lot of times we've seen where the kids will move into our community. And now their parents are visiting to see their grandkids. And the next thing we know, the parents are buying or vice versa. Yeah. So I, I think that there are certain personality types yeah. that shouldn't live in a master plan community. That and unfortunately, live in a sometimes plan? they buy there. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> um, but no, I think it, it's across all segments. I, and, you know, if you design it properly, there's something for everyone. Yeah, the the curmudgeon, right? The you kids stay yeah. off my lawn. Maybe not the best for master plans, yes. especially a diverse May, And they plan. show up at the HOA meetings yeah. too. <laughs> of course a lot. they do. <laughs> yes. Fun, fun, fun times. Let's, let's talk about the market. Let's talk about demographics. There are, let's first talk about where sort of master plans, you know, there are some infill for lack of better term master plans like Playa Vista in Los Angeles, Los Angeles area comes to mind, a great master plan. Uh, but yes. most master plans are kind of creatures of suburbia. Be, uh, should they be? Do they have to be? Do you think master plans can work anywhere? I think master plans can work anywhere. Obviously, if you're looking at more of an infill location, you'll be at a much smaller scale, more than likely. But I, I think it can still work anywhere. Um, not in a very urban area. I don't see that, obviously. But for sure, creating a lifestyle, creating a community, that, that can happen anywhere. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's just a function of land and land prices that you have master plans tend to be in suburbia or even exurbia? I, I think that's true. Yes. Yeah. Would you, okay, we, we're in a market now that is trending downward in terms of price in most markets in the country, especially in the West, Western U.S. Do you, I mean, are you thinking now a little more about apartments because they are at typically less onerous, you know, income, household income kind of, of appeal there? Are you, are you thinking about different products, maybe densifying anything like that as a reaction to the, mar to the market? Well, if, if, if we're talking about the, the current conditions today and we're not talking about, say, 2008, we wouldn't be able to pivot quickly enough to respond to the market conditions. So you have to have confidence in what you've done. Um, you have to, you know, you, ha you really have to consider where you're going to find your buyers. And if anything, in a down market, we really push on the marketing side. Um, we always tend to stay very close to our neighborhood builders. We we meet with them constantly. Um, so if someone isn't doing that, you should be talking to them to just make sure. I mean, 
we're successful if they're successful. So we are very close to our neighborhood builders. We look at different ways to find buyers. Um, we recently went to this, what's called out of home with all the digital displays at car charging stations, airports, fitness centers. And that's actually been yielding some pretty good results for us. Um, but you, you know, it, and, and it's not really that bad today. You know, we're all we've all got spoiled over the last, you know, two years. Right now, uh, sales are consistent with what we were seeing in 2019. Wasn't bad, you know, but we just got so spoiled. Um, so there was place for the pricing to come down a little bit. And that's OK. You know, I don't think that's a problem. Um, the, really, the challenge, one of the biggest challenges um, as I look out trying to attract buyers, um, I heard some t- statistics the other day. 92% of the mortgages in the United States are, are 5% or less. Mm-hmm. And of that, 49% are 3.5% or less. So how are you going to get someone to leave their low mortgage and to say, okay, yeah, I'm really excited about a 7% mortgage. Yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, that sounds like a good idea to me. So they have to consider buying a l- less home than they probably wanted to. Mm-hmm. But there's always going to be those lifestyle changes that's going to force someone to, into the new home market in, or, or into a home market. Um, you know, it's going to be marriage. It's yep. going to be a child. There's any number of things that can happen. There are buyers out there. You just have to go find them. So do you think about that? Do you think, OK, so let's think about those not locked in buyer segments. Like you said, an expanding family or a divorce situation, a split family. Right. Our, our relocations. Will you think about, literally think about, okay, let's design some, some products specifically for those more likely buyer types here in the near term? Or is that just, um, is it just too, you know, do you have to think too far ahead to, to deal with that? For us, we, we have to think so far ahead. Okay. Um, so if, so right now today, if I said, okay, this down market, I need to design product. I need to, you know, rethink some of the things I'm doing. It's two years before I, I can get it on the ground. And then we're, we already, we already suspect at the end of 2023, 20, or excuse me, 2024, 2025, things should be getting better. And, you know, as far as the interest rates, you know, it's going to get to a point where they will come down. Will they ever be sub 3% again? Who knows? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. But they may get down to 5% and you can refinance or they may get to four and a half and you can refinance. Yeah. So, you know, the, there are always going to be those options out there in the future. So it's almost as if you kind of strategically, not ignore, but strategically weight less very, very current market factors in a master plan because you do have that long time horizon. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and you just have, like I said before, you have to be confident in what you've put on the ground and what you're thinking about putting on the ground. And what the fundamental demand factors are in your location, not what's Correct. just right now, especially when yeah, you have- and who Yeah, who your buyer is, who, yep. who's going to come in to your community and want to buy your homes. Okay. Let's talk about some age qualified. Are you doing that now at Rienda? Are you about to start some 55 plus? Do I have that right? We are. We have two 55 plus neighborhoods opening uh, in December. Um, they, it's part of our Gavilon branded 55 plus. They'll have their own exclusive amenity with a plunge pool and a spa. Of course, you're not going to not put a spa in, right? <laughs> now you're not. For <laughs> yeah, sure. now you're not. Um, there's about 145 of those, uh, 145 homes there. But what we're really looking at right now is we have a very large um, consolidated Gavilon Ridge. It's called Gavilon Ridge area that we're looking at. It's over 600 homes. Um Right now, I, I, I think it will open in 2025. I don't know for sure, um, but that's sort of what I'm looking at. And one thing we do is we do a lot of research. We do a lot, a lot, a lot of research. We spend a lot of money on research. And so looking ahead to Gavilon Ridge, we know that it's going to be Gen Xers. Gen Xers are 57 as of this year. So they are going to be our buyer um, and the younger boomers. We, okay. we know that. So um, you're still you're still looking at the last part of the boomers, but you are now correct. for sure thinking the older Gen Xers. Correct. So um, we are really looking at the leading edge um, uh, Gen Xers and the younger boomers as our Gavilon Ridge buyer. And so what we're doing to understand them as a buyer, we just recently completed a series of focus groups. Um, we did six different focus groups uh, with both 
younger boomers and older Gen Xers to ask them really, what does a 55 plus community look like to you? Um, And as we know, Gen X had completely different experiences going through their life stages than the boomers did. So we need to understand, are they ready to consider a deed restricted home? Do they still have kids living at home? Um, What do they want in terms of amenity or a lifestyle? Uh, Single level living, are they okay with bedrooms up and the bedroom, you know, the master down? So these are all sort of the things we're trying to figure out. Um, And the initial research showed that Without a doubt, the most important things to those two groups are pools and spas, trails, and indoor fitness. So our next step in terms of this research is putting together some concepts um, internally and then going back out and sort of taking their temperature to say, well, what do you think about this? And try to elicit some reactions that way to really try to hone in on what they're looking for and what would prompt them to purchase a home in a 55 plus community. Chris, let me ask you this. How, how do you account for changes, or at least you know, in, in an age-qualified community, to your residents? That is to say, when you first sell it, your residents are going to be of a certain age. As that age-qualified community ages, they're going to be of an older age in general. Do you account for that? Do you think about that? Do you try to maintain some kind of flexibility to account for that? I think that um, we always are, we always design clubhouses with maximum flexibility. Um, but as you know, as our buyers age and age out, younger buyers come in. So you always do end up with sort of a, a refresh, I guess. But you know, at the end of the day, a well designed clubhouse is is a well designed clubhouse. And really, what I've seen, and I, I think this is really interesting, is the way the residents choose to activate the spaces themselves. Right now we have um, 60, a total of 60 resident led clubs and 50 of those are 55 plus. So they're very, very active in terms of the clubs. I think there's four or five pickleball clubs. I think there's three or four um, bocce clubs. There's book clubs, there's travel clubs, there's dinner clubs. There, I mean, every kind of club you can think of. So, you know, maybe they're not going to get in the pool and swim laps, but they still are going to get the connection with their neighbors and friends via the clubs. And so you make sure that you have great spaces to host the clubs. And I guarantee you there's a wine tasting club. Am I right? <laughs> Probably a couple of them. <laughs> I was going to say, for age, qual- age qualified and for not so much, too, I'm, I'm sure. There's the red wine club and the white wine club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's, uh, that's a, not a bad idea. Okay. Now, Chris, we're going to delve into your future ball, your very bright future looking future uh, crystal ball. Let's talk about master plans in, you know, sort of the, I don't know, at least five, maybe even 10 year future. Are you meeting regularly internally or also with some outside consultants to just just try to constantly be at the forefront of what's next? Is that a central part of your job? Absolutely. Um, So we are actually a very small team internally and we use a lot of consultants and we use consultants from all over the United States because you know, we're, we're pretty, we can be pretty isolated here in South Orange County. So we rely on our consultants to be our eyes and ears around the country at the different, different master plans to bring us ideas. Um, and we also have, um, a, I'll call it a, a creative think tank, for lack of a better term. We have a, a group that we call the Creative Collective. And the Creative Collective was put together to do exactly that, that forward thinking, that look out to what's next, what should we be focusing on, what's going to be relevant, what do we not need to do anymore. Um, It really is an amazing group who just over the years, we've had an uncanny ability to just really come up with some very unique ideas for Rancho Mission Viejo. Do you have a sign on the wall that says, it's about the spa, stupid? For <laughs> I, I took that one down now. I, I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> That's internalized completely. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, now we're stretching out. We're going five, 10 years. What do you think is going to be, you know, the must-have master plan, it, not just amenities, but whatever factor you can think of that is maybe a little different than is true today? I have a good one. Okay. Unmanned aircraft for commuting. Ooh. I actually think Lake Nona's looking at that. Um, 
But, you know, there, of course, where is technology going to go? That's going to be interesting. Where is the whole work from home going to go? Um, yeah. I, I, those are the things that I, I think about, but, uh, the aut- autonomous vehicles, you know, we really haven't gotten into that yet. Again, Lake Nona has it. Um, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, what does that mean for planning? What does any of these things mean for planning? Um, one thing, you know, over the years, our parking requirements have been so onerous and so draconian. And, you know, the whole notion of autonomous cars, it really changes that dialogue significantly and then how we can plan things. Um so it'll it'll be interesting as we move forward. My guess has to be careful on those. I've been hearing some things that the unmanned cars are probably further away than we think they are. You know, so remember that for a little while there, we thought everybody's in urban areas. They thought, well, everybody's just going to Uber everywhere, and they stopped right. doing parking. And that that's not true. Uh, but who knows? I mean, hovercraft. You you might have hovercraft. Hovercraft. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> Right. Yeah. For the the the, uh, the Gen X was raised on the when they're very small on those film strips that showed hovercraft in the far off 1980s or 90s <laughs> or whatever. So who knows? I remember uh, so that. How about any like COVID era lessons? You know, indoor outdoor. Everything has to be indoor outdoor, or, or everything has to be outdoor. Even or, or what COVID COVID era new new feature might really have some legs and last into the far off future? Um, I think that COVID really taught us that our homes can be a lot more than we've asked them to be in the past. And I think there's certain things that families are looking for now. Um, I, I don't think that many people go to the movies anymore. I think we all learned that, hey, you know what? Sitting in your house with your wine out of your refrigerator and you can make popcorn and you know, you can re see a scene if you need to, or get up and use the restroom and the whole being able to work out at home. I mean, so many things came out during COVID that just taught us different ways to look at our homes and use our homes. Um, So I think a lot of that is going to stick with us. And I know we have a a very high percentage of residents that still are working from home. Um, I think that we tend to have um, a lot of business people, um, a lot of white collar, and I think they have more of an ability to uh, to work from home. So we've really been thinking about our technology and, and, and pumping up our technology that we're including in the community. Um, We're bringing internet to more locations. So if people want to get out and work remotely within the community, they have the ability to do that. Um, I think one thing that I'm finding a little interesting right now is I was really surprised when COVID hit and our builders, our home builders ability to pivot so quickly and to figure out how to still sell their homes in the middle of this crazy thing that was going on around us. And we had unbelievable sales here during that time. We sold out a lot sooner than we had been planning on. But now I'm sort of starting to see the builders are shifting back a little bit. I thought it was so unique how they managed to turn to keyless entries and you know, get people into model homes at any time instead of having someone sitting at a, in a sales center from 10 to 5 when the vast majority of their buyers were probably at work at that time. But now I see it shifting back a little bit, and I'm kind of disappointed in that. I really thought that the builders would, would grab the success that they saw during COVID and figure out how to improve that as we go forward instead of going backward. I, so that's a little disappointing to me. I, I totally agree with that. I think this, that, that it, it, having it be 10 to 5, I think is just nuts. That makes no yeah. sense whatsoever. And But but also going 100% virtual, I'm not sure that's smart. I think people do eventually at some point when they get really serious, want to talk to someone face to face. So yes. having almost a hybrid model where you can go virtual, but you also talk to someone and where maybe your sales agent leaves at five or six o'clock, but you still have appointments till nine o'clock, something like that. Right. Hopefully we'll right. see. Do you think you still have the experiential kinds of public gatherings? Okay. So the, in the COVID area, everything, you know, those public things kind of, you know, went away or certainly were, were lessened. But you mentioned movies. People don't go to movies anymore, but might they go to like a, like a drive-in, you know, drive-in over the lake kind of a thing where they gather with all their friends and have, you know, it becomes kind of an experience. 
Absolutely. You know, we we do a lot of large scale events through Ranch Life, which is our lifestyle um, brand. And we did um, what we call West Fest a couple mu- uh, a month or so ago, and it was hugely attended. So those types of branded events where it can really bring the community together, still very, very popular. And we will continue to do those and probably expand on them. Here, here's a, a, a kind of a pet question of mine, because I, I've, I'm just kind of waiting for, we talked a little minute ago about uh, dispersal versus central amenities. My, for some reason, I think that I, I see amenities becoming much more dispersed and almost always dispersed and, and shifting away from that big central amenity. Am I just completely wrong? It just depends. Um, you, you, like I said, you re- it, the more amenities you build, the more you drive your HOA costs. And that is something that you really need to stay on top of because at some point, the higher the HOA is, it's an impediment to absorption. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very fine equation that you just have to work through. Um, and again, it depends on the scale of the community. How far out are we going to see master plans? They're already kind of in the exurbs. I mean, are we going to see rural master plans as land becomes more scarce? Will master plans just keep pushing out further and, and further in the, you know, again, this 5, 10, 15 year time period? I, I'm going to answer for California and I'm going to have to say no. Um, there's already um, there's already been some communities that have been um, up against it in terms of trying to develop uh, so I, I, I can't speak for other parts of the, the country, but I think in, in California, that's, that's probably a no. Yeah, the antagonism toward, quote unquote, sprawl becomes yeah. a pretty big impediment towards exurb. Yeah. And, and just the wildfire situation, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's a problem. That's a good point. Do you see, yeah. though, more densification in master plans, getting away from larger detached homes as a whole and becoming more and more dense? We already do that, and I think um, the competitors, our competitors in the Orange County market, do that. Um, I don't think I can get any. Uh, you know, right now I have a uh, condo project that's thirty uh, units to the acre. It's literally uh, an apartment that's for sale. So mm. I don't think I can get any more dense than I have. Um, I know in other markets, you know, they're they're always talking about how to get more attainable homes, get more dense, because um, they're just not. They haven't been building that way, but that's sort of been um, on our, our on our. What am I trying to say? That's sort of been in our wheelhouse for quite a while. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, it's amazing how I know it took a, a, a couple decades at least, but it really, or maybe less than that actually, but it really went from the planning's and the planners and the cities telling you, no, 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 that's too dense. You've got to build homes just like the homes next to you too. Oh no, you need to have high rises in your suburban master plan. It's right. flipped quite a bit. <laughs> Correct. You guys ha- introduced something, the intranet at Ladera Ranch, one of your master plans. Correct, that. yes. That was pretty cutting edge at the time. What is the next big tech thing in a ma- master plan? Will we have almost like smart master plans the way we have smart homes? I think so. You know, and as, as I said before, with the amount of people that we have um, – on, uh, still doing work from home. Um, we have already kicked off a tech initiative. As a matter of fact, my, my next meeting here is, is our monthly technology um, catch up. Uh, we, we have a consultant that we work with. We look at ways to, first of all, bring, bring different providers into the community. We've, we've run a shadow conduit now so that the, our homeowners have an option of going with someone else. Um, we really think that it, a lot of it's got to be about choice. And because with choice, there's definitely more options and different ideas. Yeah. No, they're not all going to put a chip in their head when they right. do master plan. <laughs> we hope, although, you know, <laughs> how, okay, I'll, I'll let you go then with last question. How do you predict the next pickleball? I, I mean, the next hot <laughs> thing that no one, I think, saw coming. Is there a way to predict that? I just be super flexible and hope for the best. You got, you have to, you have to have your ear to the ground. I mean, pickleball is just a phenomena and, you know, it actually, I th- I'm pretty sure it started in the sixties though, up in Washington. And we started hearing about it. Um, we were doing a 55 plus tour a number of years ago. And that's when we started hearing about it. Um, 
So what what is it that's great about pickleball? And I think that the recipe behind pickleball, which is easy to learn, doesn't take a high level of fitness, um, it, it isn't really expensive to put on the ground, you, you know, that that's what makes it so popular. Uh, and, and I think that, that, again, that's the recipe. So if, if you can figure out what that is, and I don't know what it is. I wish yeah, I did. That's the thing. I still don't have enough pickleball on the ground yet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just have to keep your, like you said, keep keep your ear out. Keep your, just try to uh, watch ESPN, the Ocho for the weirdest new sport. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and and uh, travel around and see what's starting to just catch on in its earlier sta- earliest stages. That's going to be tough. Yeah. But it'd be nice yeah. to be at the front of that it, when, Boy, when I wish. That, that next thing does come. Yeah. Chris, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been well, great. Well, thank you. Had a lesson in master plans. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the New Home Insights podcast. I'm Dean Worley, and we will see you again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>